send them all. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This is my full Black Adam breakdown and Easter eggs for the entire movie. Hopefully you've had a chance to see it. There's a bunch of big stuff that they set up, a bunch of sequels, obviously a bunch of cameo scenes, a big post credit scene we've all been talking about. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos and obviously careful for spoilers for the movie because we have to talk about everything that happened. I also just did a post credit scene for the big Superman Henry Cavill post credit scene with him coming back and what that means in the DCEU. I will address that during this video, but I've done like a much bigger video just about the Superman scene. So I'll link that at the end of this and down in the description below. But the movie is inside the DCEU, if it wasn't clear. It takes place after the events of the Justice League movie, after the new Suicide Squad movie, obviously, and before the events of Shazam Fury of the Gods, also probably after the events of Peacemaker. If you've been following the DC movies for a long time now, you may remember that they officially cast The Rock as Black Adam over 10 years ago. So a lot of you are asking, why did it take them over 10 years to make this movie? That's mostly because when they were originally casting The Rock as Black Adam, like more than 10 years ago, at that time we were still sort of in the old regime. It was still Christopher Nolan era Batman with Christian Bale. The Warner Brothers people had very different plans about the future of the DCU and developing all those characters, all the Justice League characters, the future of Superman, Batman, everybody. So at the time, they just didn't know how to fit in an anti-hero. Obviously, now things are very different. The DC universe itself is very different. The actual Black Adam character debuted inside the original Fawcett comics Shazam stories back in 1945. He debuted as a Shazam villain in the original Shazam family comics, basically. His origin in the movie draws a little bit from his original origin story, like the very first one back in 1945, and a little bit from the New 52 version of his origin story, with a couple changes that I'll address when we get to those parts of the movie. In his original origin story in 1945, in the Marvel Family number one, they explained the wizard granted powers to a person called Teth Adam based on, at the time it was Greco-Roman gods like the Shazam character, but then later they retconned that to Egyptian gods. So their power words are both Shazam, but the acronyms stand for different gods. In that original story, Black Adam killed the current Pharaoh and then tried to rule the planet himself. The wizard, in revenge, basically kicked him to the other side of the universe, and it took Black Adam 5,000 years to get back to planet Earth, and when he got back, it was present day he fought the Shazam family. The New 52 aspects of his origin story are everything about his son passing him his powers and him being trapped in the magical prison for the last 5,000 years. Originally, their plan was to actually introduce him during the first Shazam movie because that is the New 52 origin story for Shazam. The story of Billy Batson getting his powers is New 52, but during that, instead of just the Seven Deadly Sins being released, Black Adam also gets released and winds up trying to fight the Shazam family at the end. So you have to imagine the end of the first Shazam movie where they all get the powers and they all wind up fighting Black Adam instead. Eventually, they decided to just separate their origin story, so Black Adam became a solo movie, and they just continued with the Shazam movie, just substituting in a lot of the Dr. Savannah plot. Eventually, they will have a crossover with Shazam versus Black Adam, but they have to kind of work up to that. Right now, it seems like they're more focused on Superman versus Black Adam, as you see in the post credit scene. We'll get there eventually. The opening credits are meant to be similar to the Shazam opening credits with a darker vibe because they're setting him up as an anti-hero. The oozing black liquid running across the logo as it forms is meant to be a parallel for the end credit scenes where they show the different character suits forming with the same kind of oozing metal all over their suits. That's meant to be a reference to the way that Black Adam's suit forms around him out of magic like Sabak's and Dr. Fate's and Hawkman's and everyone else's forming with nanites basically. The movie actually starts with a flashback to his original time in Kondok 5,000 years ago to explain his origin story in the DCEU. Like I said, couple minor tweaks to his backstory. They don't give you the entire story till a little bit later in the movie, but the whole idea is that in the DCEU, Kondok was meant to be the center of civilization, like the first major civilization 5,000 years ago. Looking at the entire DCEU timeline, you remember that the Dark Side War happened 10,000 years ago, so like Atlantis existed before Kondok, so technically there were civilizations before Kondok. Wonder Woman is also just a little bit older than Black Adam. She's a little bit over 5,000 years old. And if you really want to dig into deep history, making more Superman references because of the big Superman Henry Cavill post credit scene, the Kryptonian ship that he winds up finding in Man of Steel is over 20,000 years old. So technically that's like the oldest artifact we found next to the actual Rock of Eternity. Because there's a lot of teasers for other untold history that they don't totally explain during the movie, like setting up big plot points that they'll cover in the sequels. The current king of his day forces them to mine Eternium, which are fragments of the Rock of Eternity that have fallen to Earth that only exist in Kondok. In their current form, they have magical properties that are like laced with magic, which is how Intergang's tech runs on it and has all those special properties, and how they can use Eternium weapons to harm Black Adam. 
Here's where we start setting up the sequel movies, the reason why there would be fragments of the Rock of Eternity in Kondok before the events of this movie, like they imply that they're buried in the earth and they've been there for a long time, is there had been some ancient battle that the wizards had before this that they don't get into in the movie that they'll cover in the sequels. I actually think it was the wizards fighting Eclipso because if you remember the original teaser for the movie, they had like a completely different plot. Eclipso was a big part of it. Like you have Eclipso's gem here next to Black Adam. In the flashback during that scene to Ancient Kondok, you see this giant explosion happen and then they show all the Eclipso stuff. So I think the idea is that Eclipso attacked the Rock of Eternity and that would cause shards of it to fall to Kondok. In the comics, it's a little bit different. Dr. Savannah accidentally created Eternium when he attacked the Rock of Eternity and that's what caused the fragments to fall to Earth. Black Adam's son is chosen to be the next champion by the Council of Wizards at the time who grant him the powers from all the gods that are different from the Shazam gods, like I said, based more on Egyptian mythology. And when they grant him powers, even though they don't show him till a little bit later in the movie, his outline is made to look just like comic book Black Adam with a very special looking haircut. He winds up passing his power to his father, just like Billy Batson did with the Shazam Lee at the end of their first movie. But instead of granting him a portion of his power, he gives all of his power, leaving himself weak and able to be killed by the king's men. Black Adam then kills the king, all those men in revenge, and the wizard traps Black Adam for 5,000 years after his powers get out of control and threaten to destroy the world. In the comics, the difference is that Black Adam's nephew was the one who got the powers, whose name was Amon 5,000 years ago, and he killed his nephew after he tricked him into giving him his powers. So comic book Black Adam was way more irredeemable than the movie version. In the movie, they also give the Amon name to Adriana Tomaz's son. The former king had been using the Eternium to craft the magical crown called the Crown of Sabak, who is from the Shazam comics, like those original Fawcett era 1940s comics. And Sabak is basically like an evil version of Shazam. The Sabak name is also an acronym, just like the Shazam name, and stands for six different demon evil gods that grant the powers to this person. His acronym stands for Satan, Aim, Belial, Beelzebub, Asmodeus, and Kratius. So later in the movie when Ishmael is being granted the powers of these different demons, that's basically who you're seeing. All the different demons there are the ones that are part of the acronym. The trick that they pull, though, is that the demons are just using their Sabak champion as a finger puppet to create a conduit to the main DCU dimension so that they can conquer it. The symbol of the three triangles that shows up throughout the timeline, like the slave symbol in the past and Adriana's Eternium necklace in the future, is meant to be a reference to the normal citizens of Kondok in general, like a symbol of the slaves themselves that they use to unite, and his son and then later Amon uses big rallying cries. The actual Black Adam name is something that Adriana's son winds up helping him come up with, just saying that his Teth Adam name is very outdated. That is his real name, like his birth name that he was given, so he just calls himself that through most of the film until the end. In the present day of the movie in the DCEU, Kondok is being controlled by Intergang, who are secretly being used by Ishmael, the last descendant of that original king, to reclaim the crown of Sabak and take his powers. Inner Gang is like a whole big separate evil organization that you probably recognize from some of the comics or the Young Justice TV series. They're an intergalactic evil organization with Lex Luthor working in partnership with Darkseid. For those of you that want to see more Darkseid in the DCEU. But just to be clear, everything that Ishmael was doing inside Inner Gang was him going rogue on his own using a portion of their forces. Like the larger Inner Gang has their hands in a lot more pies around the world. So we'll probably see Inner Gang in other future things, like this isn't the end of Inner Gang by any means. When we first meet Amon, he's wearing a red hoodie, which is meant to be a reference to Billy Batson Shazam because they want him to feel just like Billy Batson, even though in the movie they use him a little bit more like Freddie Freeman because both of them are superhero Justice League fanboys. Amon has Justice League merch all over his room, comic books, posters, action figures, even real life comic books. Everything is based on real life DC merch that you could go out to a store and buy. A lot of the art that they use, a lot of the action figures and posters they use are from different eras of the comics. That's why some of the logos look a little bit different. Like this isn't Ben Affleck's Batman logo. This looks a little bit closer to Michael Keaton's Batman logo. You have some Jim Lee Batman art. You have some Rebirth era Cyborg comics for those of you wanting more Cyborg in the DCEU. The whole idea is that the Justice League heroes have just become pop culture icons. So a lot of merch is being created around them. So the idea is that DC Comics does exist inside the DCEU. It's the same thing in the Marvel movies too. Like there is a company inside the Marvel movies that's named Marvel Studios that creates Marvel comic books as well. But basically you see merch from all the main Justice League heroes. The only one I didn't feel like I saw Easter eggs for here was Green Lantern. There were Green Lantern Easter eggs though in the Shazam Fury of the Gods trailer video. So that means that there is Green Lantern stuff happening in this universe if there's merch being created about the character. 
I also think Amon being in the red hoodie foreshadows Black Adam eventually giving him a portion of his powers like Billy Batson did, along with Adriana Tomas, like they basically set up him granting them powers, creating his own version of the Shazam family, which is something that they did a lot in the comics. Also him in the red and wearing the red cape later foreshadows the Superman post credit scene with Henry Cavill. We meet Adriana Tomas, who's a longtime love interest of Black Adam in the comics. They do eventually get married. In the DCEU, she worked at a local university in Kondok. She studies history, which is how she knows everything about the Eternium, the Crown of Sabak, how she could read the ancient Kondok language on Black Adam's prison. She's also kind of a freedom fighter, too. They use the first big action scene when she releases him to show you his basic powers, but the soft explainer on that, pretty easy, is that his powers are exactly like Shazam's powers. We find out that Amanda Waller has been monitoring everything, knows about Black Adam getting out of his prison. I believe she knows what Inner Gang is doing, like she's been monitoring them. She knows about the Eternium that they use in its value, but it sounds like she doesn't totally know what's going on with the actual Crown of Sabak and what Ishmael has planned. The reason she calls the Justice Society instead of the Justice League at first is just because she doesn't think the problem was big enough to require Superman and the others, like she refers to them later in the movie as an even bigger favor that she has to call in. Also in the comics, Black Adam has way more history with the Justice Society characters than the Justice League, so on a story level, it just made more sense to start with the Justice Society, and they want to grow the DCEU as much as possible, which requires them introducing a bunch of new characters, so it just made more sense to use those characters than to start out with the Justice League. The movie only gives us a little backstory on the original version of the Justice Society team. They said that was on purpose and they'd explain characters' origins and future movies and spinoffs. But on the DCEU Earth, they implied that the Justice Society used to be a big thing 30, 40 plus years ago when all the characters were very young, with the exception of Dr. Fate and Hawkman, who either had their lives extended by the helmet of fate and his powers or, in the case of Hawkman, reincarnate. The original version of the Atom on that team was played by Henry Winkler, who's obviously an old man. Also, Cyclone's mother is the original Red Tornado, and she was on that original Justice Society team. The way they're explaining Dr. Fate in this movie is they're going with the more cosmic origin story, not the one that you saw during Young Justice with Vandal Savage. In this version of the origin story, the original one, Kent Nelson was a Swedish-American who discovered the Tomb of Naboo with his father, having accidentally killed his father due to a deadly gas. The Lords of Order felt pity for him and trained him in the ways of magic for a couple of decades, then bequeathed him his mystical amulet, the Helmet of Fate, the cloak, as well as his knowledge before he started his career as Dr. Fate. The Lords of Order and Chaos are primordial forces in the DCEU that existed at the dawn of creation. They kind of exist in an alternate dimension and influence all of reality. In the DCEU, the origin story for Naboo, who basically is the spirit inside the Helmet of Fate, is that he's one of the descendants of the Lords of Order who manifested themselves as the first sentient race in the universe on this other planet. Naboo was one of their descendants and he eventually traveled to planet Earth and became an advisor to the ancient pharaohs of the day. So in the movie, when they say the Helmet of Fate came from another planet, that's what they're talking about. Hawkman's backstory is way more complicated in the comics, so we'll see how they explain it in the DCEU. They might go with the Hawkworld origin story, or they might go with the archaeologist or the resurrection backstory. The basic idea is that he's a member of this ancient Thanagarian race who's got a version of amnesia and reincarnates over time and is bonded to the Nth Metal. Like, the Nth Metal comes from Thanagar. It's sort of like the DC version of Vibranium. They did say that Hawkgirl was part of the movie at one point, but they decided to do something else with the character. We'll probably meet her in either sequels or some other future DC movie, but she is inside the DCEU somewhere. They also explained that he's the person who owns the Justice Society mansion, and his mansion is meant to be like the classic Justice Society mansion. The vibe they're going with in the movie, though, is that it's a little bit more like the X-Mansion in those original X-Men movies because he has his whole jet underneath the backyard. The current Atom Smasher is the nephew of the original Atom Smasher using his original costume. That's why I keep saying that it's retro. They'll probably give him a new suit in one of the future movies in the same way that Ant-Man started out in the first Ant-Man movie wearing the original suit and then got a new one in the sequels. Cyclone is meant to be the granddaughter of the original Red Tornado who was on that original Justice Society team. When she was younger, she was captured by the scientist who created the second android version of Red Tornado who injected her with nanites giving her her powers. They're basically exactly what you see in the movie, Wind Control. They use her kind of like a version of Storm from the X-Men on the team. I already explained all the Justice League Easter eggs around Amon's room, but part of the comedy here too is him blasting Superman's picture and action figures everywhere he goes. That's just to foreshadow them fighting in the sequels. Like of all the things that he could have destroyed in Amon's room, he destroys just the Superman stuff. 
When he busts into the living room, the Clint Eastwood movie playing on the TV is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Later in the movie, they reference Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name character again, like they reference the events of the film again, when Black Adam fights the inner gang soldiers using his magical lightning as if he were the Clint Eastwood Man With No Name character. They also play the theme song from that movie when he's doing that, just to set him up as an anti-hero because Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name character was a big anti-hero as well. We get another cameo scene from Amelia Harcourt this time, last seen during the events of Peacemaker. Because she's working with Amanda Waller again, it seems like they're on relatively good terms. I think we can assume that they put their differences aside. But when they lock Black Adam up, there's a bunch of other DC villains that are also locked up there under that polar ice cap prison. It's really quick, blink on you'll miss it. It's a little too blurry, so I'll have to wait for like an HD copy of the movie to come out so we can zoom and enhance a little bit easier and see exactly what they have there. But if you think you spotted any of these other DC villains that were in the prison, write in the comments below. Adam Smasher gives Amon the red cape, like I said, foreshadowing the Superman cameo scene in the post credits and foreshadowing him getting his own powers from Black Adam in the sequels. And when Black Adam reactivates his powers again, this time his suit regenerates as if it were brand spanking new. Like previously they'd implied that his older costume he'd been wearing for the past 5,000 years in his prison and it just suffered a lot of wear and tear. So that's why it looked like there was so much battle damage and the colors were so faded. Also the new costume is meant to look a little bit more comic book accurate, like he has the comic book cape on too. Dr. Fate winds up sacrificing himself, and even though the helmet disintegrates, really what was happening, if you've read any of the comics, is that it transported itself to its next wielder, like selecting the next person to become Dr. Fate. In the comics, the second version of the character was named Eric Strauss, but we'll see who they wind up using in the DCEU when the character comes back. And then we get our big post credit scene, cameo scene, with Henry Cavill's Superman returning. And I've already done a much bigger video about this, but the whole idea is that Amanda Waller is basically putting Black Adam on notice. Like, you step out of conduct, you step out of line, we're going to call in bigger favors with more powerful people from other planets. Like, you are not the most powerful person in the universe. Maybe on the planet, but not in the universe. When he shows up, they play the classic John Williams Superman theme. He looks a little bit more like comic book Superman with a hair curl. His colors are a little tuned up, but it's the classic colors of the costume. For those of you asking too, who's more powerful, Shazam or Black Adam? The way they're using the characters right now, Black Adam is more powerful because he's not sharing his power with anyone else. Like he has 100% of the available power given to him, whereas Shazam only has a fraction of it because he's giving the rest of it to the rest of the Shazamly. The whole idea with the post credit scene though is that it's meant to directly set up sequels in the future of Superman in the DCEU. So Black Adam 2, like I said in my post credit scene video, might draw a little from the comics where Black Adam grants powers to Amon and Adriana and things go off the rails. Like Amon winds up doing something bad, Superman gets involved because he's worried about the rest of the planet. And because he lays hands on Amon, Black Adam gets pissed off at him and that's why they fight. Like it's very Captain America Civil War type of situation. They're also developing Man of Steel 2, and they also have Justice League 2 coming up that they plan on making, which will involve the Shazam characters, which includes Black Adam now as well. But if you have any big questions about plot points or big Easter eggs or references you spotted in the movie that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. And I'll talk a little bit more about Black Adam versus Shazam when we get to more Shazam Fury of the Gods stuff. That'll be dropping early next year. We'll probably get a couple more trailers for that pretty soon. My next big video will be for the House of the Dragon episode 10 finale. Everyone click here for that. I'll update the link as soon as I post it. And click here for that Black Adam Superman post credit scene. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.